So last night at our student ministry, we did this thing called Ask the Pastor Anything. And what our students did was pre-submit um, a whole lot of questions um, that I answered. Some of them were kind of silly. Um, I heard Will Goins may have had something to do with some of these. Um, but some of them were really, really good. And I wanted to just take some time to work through those and make this as a resource available to our entire church family because some of these things are super pressing matters in culture. And for some of us, these are going to be super pressing matters in our lives. And it's important for us to know how to navigate them. So we'll deal with the silly questions first, and then we'll get to the serious questions. And I hope this can be a resource that's just simply helpful for you. So the silly questions. Question number one, why do I pull the wrapper off my water bottle when I preach? I, I just do. I just take the wrapper off my water bottle because the guy who's preaching, I sat under and was saved under. Uh, he pulled the wrapper off his water bottle and it's kind of a, I saw him do it. So I just did it. I'm not even sure why he did it, but now I just do it. So I don't know that I have a great reason. I just do it and I do it without even thinking about it now. So that's that question. The second fun question. <sighs> Why am I an NC State fan when they are so bad? Um, I just kind of adopted being a State fan when I was like 11 or 12. I'm not entirely sure why. It just kind of happened. It's it's not bad is such a strong word, though. It's not that we're bad. Uh, we're just the only Power 5 school that hasn't won a conference regular season or tournament title um, in men's basketball, football, or baseball in about the last 30 years. It's not where they were, they were bad, though. Perhaps just not champions. Maybe that's a distinction without a difference. I don't know, but that's just, it is what it is. So, moving on. <clears throat> a good summer camp story. Well, I don't know that I have a good summer camp story, but I do remember on a winter retreat that we took some students on, not me, but another guy got stuck trying to leave camp. It was awesome. He had to get pulled out. I think they pulled him out with a backhoe, if I'm not mistaken. So that was that. Was that. That's the best one I got, to be honest. So um, why do you not have a pet snake? Because snakes are bad. Even the good snakes, they bite. They chew on you. You got to get a shot. All the bacteria in their mouth, it goes into your body. Not a good thing. Snakes, pff, they, they need to stay away. I will not have a pet snake. Ever, ever, ever. If my kid asks for a pet snake, I will say to either one of them, no, no pet snakes. No pet snakes. They're bad. And then the last completely unserious question, why do you hate, hate cats and snakes? Well, for snakes, they bite. That's painful. But Satan was also a snake. So you can just think about that. As far as cats, it is a common misconception that I hate cats. I actually don't hate cats. I just don't trust them. And there's a reason for that. It's because our first pet was actually a cat that we kind of sort of adopted. He just showed up one day. Grace started feeding him. We started buying him food. It was the cheap, dry stuff. He was around for about three weeks, disappeared. We find out about a month later, he wasn't just eating food at our house. He was going around to three different houses, and he stuck at the home where they were giving him fancy feast, which we were not going to pay for. So... I just don't trust cats. It's not that I hate them. I think they kill mice and stuff. Rats, fantastic. They even kill snakes. So good for you, cats. I just don't trust them all that much. That's really it. But I don't hate cats. Common misconception. So now that we've laughed a little bit at Pastor Dylan, let's deal with some things that are much more serious. So uh, the first question uh, was this. What if I share Jesus with my friends and they don't talk to me anymore? This can be a very real thing. Um, in fact, I would say it's probably one of the things that often keeps us um, kind of holding back from sharing Jesus because we're not sure how people feel about Christianity or about Jesus or about the Lord. Um, and we're very much concerned that if we cross that bridge, things just might get weird. And I understand this tension. Um, I usually don't lead into a conversation with, by the way, I'm a pastor because things just tend to get weird, like really, really 
unusual or, and maybe even they can be like okay well it was nice talking to you and they never talked to you again um but the truth of the matter is man there will be times we face rejection and we'll kind of talk about that in a second but I guess the first thing I would go with is simply this how you share Jesus matters so so let's think about that first the how matters uh, Paul writes this in Colossians 4 2 through 6 he says devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains so we should be praying for open doors with our friends our family Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Then he says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. And then he says this, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So, four things there. First off, uh, pray that God will give you an open door. Second off, um, just make it clear. Make it really, really clear. Make sure you're not confusing. Third, be wise because timing really does matter. Timing is super, super important. Um, there are some times where it's a good opportunity to share Christ. There are other times where the timing is not the best. You have to be wise and discerning in your timing. And then be very gracious in your approach. So often scripture will use um, uh, salt as a metaphor for truth. And so when he says, let your, great, you'll let your speech be full of grace and seasoned with salt, the idea is this. We want to be honest, but we want to be more gracious. And we don't want to be so honest that it's distasteful. You know, for instance, think of it like trying to eat a steak. If I'm going to eat a steak, I don't want it without salt. That would be gross. But I don't want to dump the whole salt shaker on there because that's just disgusting too. What do we want to do? We want to season it with salt. And so when we share Jesus, we want to be gracious and we want to be honest, but we don't want to just ram the truth down their throat because that's distasteful to people. Um, so you want to be honest, but be discerning on how much of it you give people and when you give people. Um, so that would be the primary thing I would say. Consider your approach. Um, the truth is the gospel is offensive. There's no way to say you're sinful, separated from God, destined for hell, you need a savior in a way that's like not at least a little offensive. Um, the gospel is offensive, but our approach should not be. However, even with the best approach, some level of rejection is honestly inevitable. In fact, Jesus says this um, in John 15, verse 18 through 21. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they'll obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. The truth, guys, there is this. There will always be a cost to following Jesus. And the other truth is this. It's going to be controversial. In fact, Jesus said this, Matthew 10, 34. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone, he says this though, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And then he says this, whoever finds their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So, Man, anytime we share the gospel, the truth is it's going to be controversial. And there's going to be a cost. Even with the best, most life-giving, kind, gracious, gentle approach, there will still be a level of rejection and a level of loss that we experience in our lives as a function of just sharing Jesus with other people. But what Jesus reminds us of there is this, um, that many times following him 
it's like picking up a cross. It's not easy. It's painful. It's actually an instrument of death. So we will face loss, but that's actually where we become most alive when we are on mission with Jesus out of our comfort zone, sharing the gospel. Because yes, there will be some that reject us, but there will be others who accept the message of the gospel and their eternities change because of it. So it's going to have a cost. There's going to be rejection, um, but there will also be people who respond and whose lives are changed forever. So whoever asked that question, really good question. Uh, second question was this. Can I be friends with non-Christians? Um, that has two answers. A very short answer and a little bit of a longer answer. The first answer is this. Yes, you can be friends with non-Christians, and you should be. Matthew 18, uh, verses excuse me, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says this. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let me just ask you this very simply. How do we make disciples if we do not know people who are not followers of Jesus? You can't do it. If you're going to find somebody, lead them to Christ, and baptize them, then you need to know somebody who's not a follower of Jesus. And the most likely situation in which a non-Christian becomes a Christian is when they are friends with a Christian. Because when you have a friendship, when you have a real relationship with somebody, you're far more willing to listen to that person because you know they care. So, yes, there's a fly buzzing around my head. That's very annoying. So, We'll just have to deal with the fly, I guess, because I'm not start stopping this video and starting over. That would just be annoying, too. So we'll just deal with the fly. Um, the better question is maybe this. is not whether can I be a friend uh, to a non-Christian. The better question is this. How do I navigate a friendship with somebody who is not a Christian? Um, and Colossians 4, 5, going, going back to that verse, says this. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Um so how do you navigate a friendship with somebody who's not a Christian? You use wisdom. You want to be wise in your interactions. So what might that wisdom look like? Um, man, staying firm in your beliefs without compromise. That in and of itself can be difficult, but that's what we're called to do. We have our beliefs. We stand firm on them. We do not compromise them. That doesn't mean be a jerk. Remember, let your speech be full of grace, seasoned with salt, but we're not going to compromise our beliefs, our convictions. Um invite them to be a part of what we're doing. Um, that's one of the ways you navigate those things. Invite them to your thing. Um, for instance, you know, if, if you're a teenager especially, um, if you're invited to a weekend party at a friend's house and that friend is not a believer, it may not be the wisest idea to go because of what's going on there. And you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you may be tempted to do something that compromises your convictions. On the other hand, it is wise to invite them to your home, into your thing, into our church family, into our student ministry environment, our Sunday ministry environment. Be somebody who invites them and bring them onto your turf. Um, and honestly, that's one of the most welcoming things we can do is, hey, Come into my home. Be a part of my family's life. Be a part of what we do. Be on my turf. Um, another thing that would be wisdom is be a thermostat and not a thermometer. What that means is this. You set the standard um, as opposed to your beliefs and your behavior just mirroring the temperature of everybody else in the room. You set the standard and you define how things are going to go, how you're going to live, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Be an influencer, not someone who is influenced. Um, and then one of the things that just is really necessary, in a friendship with somebody who's not a follower of Christ, be wise about who's influencing who. Because one of the worst things we can actually do is, is when we get into a friendship with a non-believer and then we start to compromise our convictions, you know what label that immediately puts on us? 
hypocrite. And if we're compromising our convictions and our beliefs, then why would they listen to what we have to say about Jesus? And so there are some times where if you find yourself just consistently influenced in a negative way by a friend, you may need to put some distance between that relationship. So, yes, be friends uh, with folks who are not followers of Christ. Be wise in the way you navigate those friendships. Um, there is one major exception. Missionary dating. What is missionary dating? Missionary dating, and I see it sometimes with guys. Most of what I've seen in my years of ministry, and a good chunk of that was in student ministry, most of the time, I, what I see is young ladies dating guys that, honestly, they're not running after Jesus that hard. What is missionary dating? Missionary dating is when you're following Jesus, you want to honor the Lord with your life, but you start dating somebody who is either very immature in their faith or they're not a believer at all. And let me define very immature in their faith or not a believer at all. It is very easy for somebody to say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. In fact, well, I'll say this. I think one of the worst first questions you can ask somebody that's a potential dating partner is, are you a Christian? Because they can say yeah to that. And they may not really even know how to define that. So you need to be wise in this. Um, you don't need to date somebody who's not running after the Lord at least as hard as you are. Because um, what ends up happening is you get out of alignment. And Scripture is actually pretty clear about this. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15 says this, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Friendships, fine. Dating relationships, completely not fine. Because there's something tremendously different about the dynamic in a romantic relationship and a regular friendship. When your heart gets involved, when your emotions get involved, what often happens is we will make decisions for the sake of a relationship and convictions and standards start to slide to the level of the low, what's the best place to say it? Our standards and convictions in a dating relationship often tend to slide to the level of the person who's the least spiritually mature and not necessarily rise to the level of the one who is most spiritually mature mature. That's often what tends to happen. Um, if you date somebody who's either very immature in their faith, kind of a Christian in name only, or simply not a Christian, the thing that I can promise you is they will be a drag on your faith journey. It will be like trying to run a 100-meter dash with a 10-pound ten bowling ball uh, strapped onto your ankle. It is an unwise idea. And what so often happens um, is people go into these things and they're like, they, they may not say it out loud, but the mindset is this, well, I can fix them. And can I just honestly say, no, you can't. Only Jesus can change them. And when we engage in what's called missionary dating, we actually get in the way of Jesus doing the work that he needed to do in their life. Dating is probably another topic for another time, but let me just give you some, some quick pointers about it to think about it. Um, you have to be clear on your vision for dating. And at the end of the day, dating is about finding somebody to be married to. And so uh, if you're a teenager, you need to ask, am I even really at the point to start pursuing somebody I want to spend the rest of my life with? Um, that's a question to, to strongly, strongly consider. Um, and I think often we way too easily adopt what the rest of culture tends to view dating as. Um, it's just this fun thing that everybody else does. Um, but man, if you're not super careful with it and super intentional about it, it can lead to a lot of broken hearts. Um, you need to have really clear standards about who you're going to date. I would say, I would say the best thing to do is simply this: run as hard as you can after Jesus. Because if you're running as hard as you can after Jesus, then the only way you're going to find somebody to spend the rest of your life with 
is if they're running as hard as they can after Jesus as well. That's the way you find the right person. Don't worry about finding the right person. Run after Jesus, and you'll end up with somebody running alongside of you that's running after the Lord as well. So, good question. The next one is this, and this is maybe a really big one, especially considering uh, that it is the month of June. Can you be gay and a Christian at the same time? It's a good question. I think there's actually a better way uh, to navigate that question. And again, it goes like this. Um, I think there's three parts to it. One, is homosexuality a sin? Two, can I struggle with an attraction to someone of the same sex and still be a Christian? And three, can I actively participate in a homosexual lifestyle and be a Christian? So, is homosexuality a sin? Well, 1 Corinthians um, 6, 9-11 through 11 says this, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it says. And so, homosexuality is not singled out on that list, but it is a part of that list. And I think, I think and, and, and what he's talking about here is, is homosexual practice. The, the act of having sex with somebody of the same sex. That's what I identified here. Um, I think the mistake that we can sometimes make as Christians is to harp on homosexual behavior like it is like this queen mother of all sins, whereas Paul listed in here with a whole bunch of other sins. And I think sometimes we, we wrongly like harp on that. Um, but is it, is it a sin? Yes, but it's a sin just like pride is a sin. Just like living together is a sin. Just like watching porn is a sin. Just like idolatry is a sin. Just like greediness is a sin. Swindling, getting drunk. All of those things are sins. And so is it a sin? Yes. And let, let, let's talk about the word sin here. Sin just is actually an archery term. It means to miss the mark. And God's mark is perfection. Anything out of what God defines as perfect, and God created the world so he makes the rules, Anything outside of that, God defines as sin. So, is it a sin? Biblically, yes. Now, the question then is, okay, but, but, but why is this a sin? Is there like a why behind the what here? And there actually is. Um, and it actually goes to understanding what God is communicating through the institution of marriage. So, Paul writes this, Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. He says, for this reason, and he actually quotes uh, Genesis uh, with the first marriage, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. This is huge to understanding why God says homosexuality is sinful. Because biblically, throughout Scripture, the proper context for sex is biological man and a biological woman in the context of marriage. That's it. Why is that? Because through marriage, God has always been communicating something. And what he's communicating is this. That through the work of God, that marriage is the work of God. Two people who are nothing alike, and men and women are nothing alike. Irreconcilable differences, you might argue. They think differently. They process differently. They are wired and literally biologically different. They're brought together in this union. And Paul says this is a picture of Christ in the church. How is it a picture of Christ in the church? Because people and God are entirely different. God is the creator. We're the created. God is perfect and holy. We are sinful and fallen. God is infinite. We are finite. Irreconcilable differences. Our sin separates us from God. And yet through the work of God in Christ, Jesus coming to earth, living a perfect sinless life, dying on the cross, coming back to life, through Christ's finished work, now these two entities with irreconcilable differences, God and people, are brought together through the work of Christ. That is why God says, man, marriage and sex belongs with one biological man, one biological woman for 
life because it is a picture of what God is doing through the gospel. And the truth is this. When you have two people um, of the same sex, you cannot preach that message because it's two people of the same thing coming together and it actually preaches a false gospel. That's why God takes this so seriously. That's why it's a big deal. It has nothing to do with God hating gays. It has everything to do with God instituted marriage as a message to point us to the reality that yes, it is possible for two entities completely unalike to be brought together. It happens through the work of God and it points us to the fact that people and God completely alike are brought together through the work of Christ, just like a man and a woman are brought together through the work of God. Marriage, it points to the gospel. That's why it's a big deal to God. Um, so is homosexuality sin? Yes, and, and we laid out why. Um, the second question was, okay, well, can I have an attraction to someone of the same sex and still be a Christian? Well, Paul writes this in Romans 7, 15 through 20. He says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So, so here's what Paul is saying here. It's very simply this. You can struggle with sin and be a follower of Jesus. You can struggle with any sin and be a follower of Jesus. You can struggle with any attraction and still be a follower of Jesus. Because um, what saves me is not my actions. It is the grace of of God. I cannot save me. That's why I need a Savior in the first place because I could not work my way to God by being good enough because I can't be good enough. That's why Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, and rose from the dead so that through his life I can have eternal life. And yes, in this world, in this body, I will still struggle with wrong desires. All of us will. That does not eliminate your faith. Your struggle does not eliminate your faith. However, there is a difference between struggling with sin and snuggling with sin, which leads to that third question, was, which was this. Um, can I actively participate in a homosexual lifestyle and be a follower of Jesus? Well, John writes this, 1 John 3, uh, verses 6 and also 9. He says this, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning, no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. That does not mean that as soon as I become a follower of Jesus, oh man, I'm perfect. What it means is this. If you're a follower of Christ and the Holy Spirit lives in you, then when God confronts you with your sin, the result is you agree with him, and you start to take the steps he calls you to take to change. Struggle with sin is probably a good evidence of real faith because you're fighting it. But when you snuggle sin, when you like, like for instance, if you're watching this and you would say you're a follower of Jesus, but there's been a sin listed that you're like, man, that's stupid. I don't agree with that at all. I don't care what the Bible says, man. Culture is is right, and, and, and that's just old, and that's outdated. And then listen, when you can hear what God has said is sin, and you're like, I don't feel bad about it at all, that just simply means you're not actually a follower of Christ because the Holy Spirit always convicts of sin. And there's a difference in wrestling with it, saying, yes, I have this struggle I'm fighting with it. I'm doing my best to bring my life under the submission of the Holy Spirit and into submission to God's Word, to honor God with my life. There's a big difference in that. And, well, yeah, I know what the Bible says, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. So can you actively participate in a homosexual lifestyle willingly, intentionally, and be a Christian? I'll just be honest. I have a hard time believing that you can do that at least for an extended period of time um 
But there's one other thing that, 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 that I would say, because so, so I, know, I know part of the question might be, be like, well, oh, man, this is who I am. And, and can I just say that, um, man, I think one of the subtle things the enemy has done in our culture is, is slapped a whole bunch of labels on us that, um, that, man, God doesn't label us as. If you're in Christ, your only label is this. You are a child of God. You are loved. And you are approved of, not because of what you do, but because of what Christ has done on your behalf. That is your identity. And in fact, I think it's telling that in 1 Corinthians um, 6, 9 through 11, verse 11, Paul actually said this when he goes through all that list of different sins. He says this, And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, the moment you become a follower of Christ, you have one identity. You're a child of God. You are no longer what you did. You are defined by who you are in Christ. That is so, so important. In fact, I would even extrapolate it to say this. There's no such thing as a gay Christian. There's no such thing as a straight Christian. Because those things are not our identity in Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a simple identity. You are God's child. How do we know that? Because Paul writes in Galatians that your life is hidden with Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've repented of your sin, given your life to Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ, which means what God says about his son, he says about you. Well, what did God say about his son? When Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water, it says that God spoke from heaven and said, This is my son whom I loved. In him I'm well pleased. That's what God says about you in Christ. You're his child who he loves, and in you he is well pleased, independent of your performance. Your activity is not your identity. And you might say, well, well, man, but I feel these desires so strongly. Man, I get it. And the truth is we all have desires that are that are aberrant, that are wrong, uh, because we live in a sinful body. We have a sinful mind. But if you'll look at who you are in Christ and look at Jesus, he will start to change you. And listen, he may never take that desire away. That temptation may be there the rest of your life. But what he will empower you to do is to, over, is to overcome it, to honor him in spite of it, and to say to the rest of the world, hey, God is better, Jesus is better than sex, than any dating relationship. He's better, and that's why I choose to follow him. So that was that question. Good question. Hopefully it helps. The last one is this, um, and this may be the most difficult one of all. It's this. When something bad happens, how do I deal with the question of why me? Um, and I think there's a couple of sub-questions to that, really. First would be, why did God let this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? And second is, if, if God is good, why did he let this bad thing happen? Um, so let's navigate through this. First off, God created a perfect world. Genesis 1 verse 31 says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. So suffering is not God's design. It's not his desire. But the truth is, sin broke the world. And what we feel in terms of pain and suffering, it, no matter what form it takes, it's all the result of sin. In fact, Genesis 3, 17, 19, this is after Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Sin enters the world. And it says to Adam, God said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Watch this. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. None of us are immune from the effects of living in a broken world. In fact, I just realized this in a very uncomfortable way a few weeks ago, um, because my boy apparently had a stomach bug. He gave it to me. Guys, it had been 
a little over 11 years since I had any sort of stomach bug. But let me just tell you, I won't get into detail, but it was thoroughly miserable in every conceivable way. It was awful. Why do stomach bugs exist? Because of sin. None of us are immune from the effects of sin that we feel in a fallen world. Um, and man, that means sometimes we suffer in the wake of somebody else's sin. And if that's you, man, my heart goes out to you. And I'm sorry. And Jesus relates to you. In fact, um, Jesus, he was betrayed by a friend. He was disowned by a friend. He was killed by the very people he created. And so, yes, sometimes that suffering, it happens in the wake of somebody else's sin. And it's not fair and it's not right, but it is a result of living in a world that is sinful and broken. But then the other truth is this. Um, none of us are immune from the effects of our own sin. And, and this might be the most difficult one to wrestle with. Um, I'll give you an example. I had a relative, um, drank heavily, smoked regularly, um, ended up with liver cancer. You might say, well, man, how could God do that? Well, I would say when you, when you make unwise choices throughout the entirety of your life, then more than likely you're going to reap the effects of those poor decisions. So, man, God's, God's design is not suffering, but the truth is because sin broke the world, none of us are immune from the effects of sin. We often suffer in the wake of somebody else's sin. And we're certainly not immune from the effects of our own sin, our own wise, our own unwise decision. And so the question then becomes, well, man, why doesn't God do something about it? And the truth is, he has and he will. It's one of the reasons Jesus came to earth to start with. In fact, Genesis 3.15, right after Adam and Eve sinned, God makes this promise, and he's speaking to Satan when he does this. He says, I'll put enmity or hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That's referring to Jesus. That yes, you'll come after him. He'll die, but he will defeat you. That was a promise. And God made good on that when Jesus came to earth and died on the cross and rose from the dead, defeating sin and death. Jesus described his purpose in John 10.10. 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they have may have life and have it to the full what does that mean? Ultimately, it means this, Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And eternal life starts right now. It's not something we wait on until heaven. And it's something we step into right now. And it's something we experience in its fullness when we step into eternity if we've given our life to Christ. And it's something that Jesus is going to bring back to earth one day. We don't know when, but this is the result for anybody who's in Christ. If you become a follower of Jesus, this is the end result. Revelation 21, 1-4 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That's what Jesus is bringing. And that's the hope we have as followers of Jesus. But it may beg the question, well, why doesn't God go ahead and do something now? And man, I get that. Um, and Peter actually answers that question, 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. He said, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. Why does Jesus wait? He may be waiting for somebody exactly like you who needs to come to Christ, who needs to repent of their sin and give their life to Christ. And the truth is this, for every single person in the world who's not yet a follower of Jesus, it is God's grace that he has not returned yet because he wants them to be a part of his family. He will fix everything. 
but just not yet because he wants as many people as are going to respond to him to be a part of his family and be free of suffering forever. And that's kind of a macro level answer. So, so I want to deal with the, 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 the more specific one, which might be this. Why is God letting me suffer in this particular way right now? And there's two things I would say uh, to start with. First off, man, I'm, I'm, I'm so, so, so sorry. I'm heartbroken. I don't know what your specific situation is, um, but I know exactly how you feel. I, I, I know your pain. Um, and I know Jesus hurts for you. And I know he hurts with you. Um, Jesus even would have faced pain and loss in his life. We already mentioned that he was betrayed. We never see any mention of his earthly dad, Joseph, after he was 12. So at some point, Jesus himself would have lost his earthly father. So Jesus knows what it's like to experience pain. Um, and man, I would say I empathize with you, but but because, because the second the second part of that question is really um I don't know why it's happening. I'll give you an example from my life. Um, back in 2018, uh, my wife and I, I think it was the very beginning of October, um, we discovered that surprise uh, we were expecting our first kid, um, and that was freaked me out at first. Um, but it was quickly replaced by, by joy and by anticipation. Um, and, and we had lined up a, um, an appointment to, to go get uh, an ultrasound and hear the heartbeat for the first time and that sort of thing. And um, the, uh, the night before we were scheduled to do that, uh, Grace started having symptoms of a, um, of a miscarriage. And, and the next day um, when we went to the doctor, they, they confirmed that, that she had, in fact, um, lost the child. Um, and this thing that in this day that was supposed to have um, a whole lot of joy um, was was absolutely unbearable, um, and it was devastating for us. And, and there are times where you know, almost five years later, I, I still weep over that. Um, it's a little easier to talk about now, just as a result of the passing of time. But um, as, as to why God allowed that moment in our lives, um, I honestly don't know. And I love the two boys that we have. I wouldn't trade them for anything. But but I don't even know really um, why if God was going to give us the two boys that we have that, that He allowed why He would allow us to go through uh, the the devastation of miscarriage. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what your pain is. I don't know why God would allow it. But I do know there are some things that are true. Um, and one is this in Psalm thirty four eighteen. The psalmist writes this, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are, those who are crushed in spirit. And I can tell you with um, my own journey through loss, um, if you'll lean into the Lord, He will be closer to you than you could ever possibly imagine. Um, and you'll find out just how strong His grace is. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 12, 7-10, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and hardships, in persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, what I found is, man, even in those moments, God's grace is so good. And that may be difficult to hear, but, but, but man, I've lived it, I've experienced it, and it's true. And what I'll leave, leave us with is this. Um, the little secret that the enemy doesn't want you to know is that in this broken world, we will suffer with or without Jesus. It's not like if we reject God that suddenly our life will be free of suffering. No, we live in a broken, sinful world, and we will suffer whether we have Jesus at our side or not. The question is simply this. Will we suffer alone, or will we have Jesus to go through it with us? And will we suffer pointlessly, 
or will our suffering actually be redeemed? Paul writes this in Romans 8, 28 through 39. He says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37 is the big one for me. He says this, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. To be more than conqueror is this. It means God takes that thing that the enemy meant to destroy you and he turns it on its head and actually uses it to be the thing that propels you into your destiny. That's what's possible in Jesus. And then Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what does God do to us or for us and through us when we suffer? First off, he makes us more like him. He conforms us to his image. And I'll say this, the best thing that can ever happen is we become more like Jesus and you know what I'm learning? It's uncomfortable, but so often that happens through suffering. I don't know really why um, God allowed my wife and I to miscarry, but I do know I'm far, far more empathetic um, than I was before. He makes us more than conquerors. He takes this thing that was supposed to destroy us, and it ends up propelling us forward into who he's called us to be. And man, we can know that he never takes his love from us. My circumstances do not change God's character. And the truth is, I don't have the ability to see everything that God sees. But in some way, I can trust his character. That if I'm going through the darkest valley, like Psalm 23 says, um, man, your goodness and love will follow me, will pursue me all the days of my life. Even in the darkest moment, God is still good to me. He still loves me, and he is still working everything out for his glory and my good. And in him, no suffering is ever wasted. It is always redeemed. So I hope, I hope that's helpful. Really good question. I hope that encourages you guys. Um, and I hope this entire uh, video has been an encouragement to you, um, the fly notwithstanding. Um, I hope it's blessed you. Um, and I hope it does really answer some questions that maybe you've been wrestling with. So I'm going to pray for us. And um, man, thank you for being a part of this. Heavenly Father, uh, we've dealt with some difficult things today. Holy Spirit, I pray you would enlighten our mind, help us to understand, and conform our understanding of the things we face, the things we go through, or things that are happening in culture to what you say, not what we feel, not what we think, not what the rest of the culture says but what you say so that our lives can shine like stars to the people around us in a way that is gracious, in a way that is loving, and in a way that truly shows you to others even when we suffer, Lord Jesus. I pray for those who have asked the questions. Lord, minister deeply to their hearts, especially um, whoever it was that asked about suffering, Lord God. I pray you'd be close to them, comfort them, and just show that you really are close to the broken heart of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Again, guys, I hope that's helpful for you. Uh, we'll be online this coming Sunday uh, with the next uh, installment of Last Words. Hope you'll tune in to Church Online or watch the YouTube video or Facebook video. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. I love y'all. We'll be back live on Sunday, July the 9th. And until then, guys, man, let's give everyone around us opportunities to live for God, love all people, and lead others to do the same. Because life in Jesus is too good to miss. I love y'all. And uh, y'all are sent.